What's up everybody, Rob here. So this very famous painting by George Bellows depicts Argentinian fighter Luis Firpo knocking his opponent clear out of the ring onto the sports writer's desk beneath him. But I'm not going to be talking about Luis Firpo, but instead going to be talking about his opponent, who would come back to win the match in the very next round. This is a very brief look at the life and career of boxing legend Jack Dempsey. And before I get started, I just want to point out that yes, I am perfectly aware of Hajime no Ippo. No, I have not actually seen it because I'm a cheap bastard and that would require me to actually, you know, pay for stuff and I refuse to do that. And uh, just make of that whatever you will. All right, here we go. William Harrison Dempsey was born on June 24th, 1895 in Manassa, Colorado. His childhood was one of extreme poverty. He was forced to drop out of school to help support his family and would leave home altogether at the age of 16. After he left home, he lived as an itinerant worker, working odd railroad and mining jobs, oftentimes being forced to live outdoors with sometimes nothing more than a parked railroad car as his only form of shelter. In order to supplement his income, he would fight in saloons for prize money. And according to him, and I quote, I can't sing, I can't dance, but I can lick any SOB in the house. If someone accepted, bets would be placed and the results would be awaited. It was during this time that he earned the nickname Kid Blackie from his jet black hair. So, as you can imagine, in these unsanctioned barroom fights for the entertainment of drunken miners, things were, well, pretty brutal. And oftentimes, fighter safety would be a second priority, or possibly even a third or fourth priority. Referee stoppages were all but non-existent, and according to Dempsey himself, in those days, they didn't stop mining town fights as long as one guy could move. So, it was in environments like these that Jack Dempsey cut his teeth as a fighter. Now, it is a bit hazy as to what his exact record was since these were unsanctioned fights that didn't have any sort of official, well, anything attached to it, but he did win most of them, mostly by knockout, though there were a few disqualifications. It was during this time that he changed his name from William Dempsey to Jack Dempsey after the famous middleweight fighter Jack Nonpareil Dempsey. He continued to build up an impressive record over the years, fighting in more popular and larger events against even professional fighters, and not just local saloon brawls against local drunks. For example, in 1918, he fought 17 times and won 15 with one loss and one no decision. Most of these wins were by KO in the first or second round. He gained a reputation for his aggressiveness, leading to his most famous fight against Jess Willard, competing for the World Heavyweight Championship. The current world champion, Jess Willard, had a reputation for his power and aggressiveness. In one match, he hit his opponent so hard that a piece of his jaw exploded off and embedded itself in his opponent's skull, killing him. He would gain the title in 1915, defeating legendary boxer Jack Johnson in an epic 26-round fight, making him the world heavyweight champion. The two men would square off in Toledo, Ohio on July 4, 1919 in one of the most famous and brutal matches in boxing history. Willard was a physically dominating specimen, standing 6 feet 6 inches tall and weighing 235 pounds. He felt confident in his victory over his much smaller opponent, claiming that he would hold on to the, to the title for the white race, a reference to Dempsey's mixed Irish, Jewish, and Cherokee heritage. Dempsey himself had other ideas. And this is a good enough time as any to go to the tail of the tape. Jack Dempsey was 6 feet 1 inches tall and weighed 187 pounds, which is very small by heavyweight standards. He had a 77-inch reach and fought in the orthodox stance, which basically means he was right-handed with a left lead. Jack Dempsey's style was one of sheer aggression. He was constantly pressing the action forward, forcing his opponents to respond to him rather than the other way around. As such, he gained a reputation over his career as being more of a brawler than that of a technician. He would just go straight in on his opponents and hopefully overwhelm them with massive power shots rather than using other more technical aspects of boxing, for example, using elaborate footwork to outmaneuver his opponents and circle around them, or grinding them down over the course of many different rounds and slowly pick them apart, or say being a counter puncher, you know, letting your opponent throw a punch at you, you block it or you know move out of the way and then countering and responding to your opponent. He didn't do that. He would just go straight in in a very hyper-aggressive fashion and just slam his opponent with as much power as possible. And even when he was on the defensive, he still used that to facilitate his offense. Okay, so now I have zero boxing experience whatsoever. I do have martial arts experience, but it wasn't much of a striking art, so we're just going to have to make do with my, at best, academic knowledge of these things rather than practical experience. It's the high quality stuff you can come to expect from me. So anyway, what Dempsey would do, he would cover up and he would use wide and erratic head movement. And he would actually crouch low, almost bent in half. And because of this, he presented a very low profile, which made him very difficult to hit. However, as he would be moving forward, he would be using the momentum of the head movement to deliver heavy punches. And of course, it would be much more 
graceful when he did it because he actually knew what he was doing and actually trained with that. But he would use the, the momentum of swinging himself, you know, which is a defensive maneuver, and use that momentum to build up power. And because of this, he was actually able to hit much, much harder than his actually relatively small frame would allow. This particular fighting style would later on inspire the likes of Mike Tyson, who would use it in his famous peekaboo style, using, again, the defensive motion of rocking back and forth and using the head movement to facilitate massive power shots, torquing your entire body into the strike. So on July 4th, 1919, the fight kicked off and Dempsey lived up to his reputation as a brawler, pushing the action early. 30 seconds in, he felled Willard with a left hook to the jaw, breaking it. Willard would recover, but would be knocked out six more times in the first round alone. This was an era again before fighter safety was really a thing, even in professional matches. And the three knockdown rule, which is a standard in boxing today, simply had not been invented yet. Somehow he managed to survive the first round and was able to stay on his feet in the second and the third round. However, at the end of the third round and the beginning of the fourth, he failed to leave his corner and Dempsey was crowned the champion. Now, some people believe that Dempsey loaded his gloves with iron or with plaster of Paris on his hand wraps, but this was never proven. Willard would suffer from a broken jaw, several broken ribs, and some spectators witnessed seeing several teeth fly out of his mouth. It would be over a year before Dempsey would defend his title. In the meantime, he performed in circuses, in various sideshow and exhibition acts, and actually starred in a low-budget Hollywood movie. His first title defense was against Bill Misk in September of 1920. The result was a third round knockout. In December of that same year, he defended his title against Bill Brennan in Madison Square Garden. In one of the longest matches of Dempsey's career, he spent the first 10 rounds taking punishment by Brennan. However, he managed to recover and in the 12th round managed to KO his opponent, which would eventually lead to the so-called fight of the century. This fight of the century was fought against George Carpentier, a French fighter who was diametrically opposed to Dempsey in terms of both style and personality, something promoters were very keen to call upon. Dempsey was a thuggish brawler who gained a reputation for his hard drinking and womanizing. This is a direct contrast to Carpentier, who was a technical boxer who was very precise using fast movement and counter punching. He was also very polite and well spoken and was the hero to Jack Dempsey's anti hero. Even though the fight was taking place in the United States, he was still a fan favorite. The bout would take place on Boyle's 30 Acres, a purpose built wooden arena in Jersey City, New Jersey. It was boxing's first million dollar gate and would be attended by 91,000 people. RCA would broadcast the fight, making it the first national broadcast. The match resembled one of a bull and a matador, with Dempsey constantly trying to press the fight and Carpentier moving around his opponent, landing counter punches. Carpentier landed a solid right in the second round, stunning Dempsey, but Dempsey soon retaliated with a flurry of punches of his own. Somewhere along the way, Carpentier broke his thumb, but pressed on anyway. Although the fight was billed as the fight of the century, it ended in the fourth round. Carpentier was knocked down for a nine count. When he recovered, a body blow sent him careening back down to the canvas again, this time for the full ten. His next title defense after the Carpentier fight would be against Tommy Gibbons. In something that is extremely rare in Dempsey's career, it actually went the full 15 rounds and resulted in a decision win for Dempsey. Dempsey's last successful title defense was against Luis Firpo in September of 1923. Firpo was a tough fighter from Argentina who knocked Dempsey clean out of the ring onto the sports writer's desk beneath them in the very first round. Dempsey, however, being full of grit and determination, refused to let something as simple as landing on a bunch of typewriters stop him, so he got back into the ring, continued to fight, and ended up knocking out Firpo in the second. After the Firpo fight, Dempsey took time off from the ring and performed exhibition matches and barnstorming. He would travel, party, and even appeared in a few films. He married actress Estelle Taylor in 1925. He wouldn't fight again until 1926. Dempsey wouldn't fight again until September of 1926 against former Marine Gene Tunney. Although the underdog, Tunney kept pressing the action forwards and was eventually awarded the decision after 10 rounds. Dempsey was considering retirement, but one does not become a champion by giving up when things get tough. His next opponent would be Jack Sharkey. Dempsey was losing most of the fight, but in the seventh round, he delivered what was apparently a low blow to his opponent. Sharkey turned to complain to the referee, forgetting the vital rule to protect yourself at all times. With his opponent turned away, Dempsey leapt forward and delivered a left hook to his opponent's jaw, knocking him to the ground. Yes, it was underhanded and somewhat controversial, but it is totally legal, and yes, when the ref says protect yourself at all times, they mean protect yourself at all times. The match was an elimination for a shot at the title and another shot at Gene Tunney. 
On September 22, 1927, Dempsey fought a rematch against Gene Tunney in Chicago, setting a record for a $2 million gate. Tunney was paid a reported million dollars, the first ever purse of that size, which is roughly $14 million in today's money. Dempsey spent most of the match taking an absolute beating and was losing on points. In the seventh round, however, he managed to score a knockdown with his trademark left hook. Now, because of Dempsey and his aggressive style, there was a new rule that was actually instituted in which in the event of a knockdown, a fighter would go to the neutral corner and allow his opponent to actually get up off the canvas. Dempsey, in his super aggressive style, would actually just stand over his opponent and wait for him to get up. And once his opponent would get up, he would just simply smash him back down again. And so this rule was implemented to give, you know, the, the opponent an actual chance to get up without getting smashed in the face by a very angry Jack Dempsey. Jack Dempsey, being Jack Dempsey, didn't do that. It took the ref a full five seconds to escort Dempsey to a neutral corner, giving Tony the extra time. He then stood up at the ref's count of nine, giving him a full 14 seconds on the ground where he could recover his wind and continue the match. He spent the rest of the round bobbing and weaving in and out of Dempsey's reach. In the next round, Tunney would drop Dempsey for a one count. In the next two rounds, the aging Dempsey was outfought and just simply outboxed by his much younger and faster opponent. Tunney once again won on a 10 round decision. With this loss, Dempsey retired from professional boxing as one of the richest and most famous athletes in America. His retirement would be short-lived, however, after the stock market crash of 1929, which cost him $3 million, along with divorcing his wife in 1930. In order to recover some of his finances, he began a barnstorming tour of the country, fighting in over 100 exhibition matches. He also refereed and promoted wrestling and boxing matches, and coached younger up-and-coming fighters. He did contemplate returning to the ring, but he never did so. In 1935, he opened a restaurant in New York City across from Madison Square Garden called Jack Dempsey's Restaurant. I guess naming stuff is not really his forte, uh, which later moved to Broadway between 49th and 50th Street, which remained open until 1974. During World War II, he joined the Coast Guard after the Army rejected him due to his age. He became a lieutenant commander and oversaw the fitness program at the Coast Guard's New York base. After his career, he published several books, including autobiographies and an instructional book titled Championship Fighting, Explosive Punching and Aggressive Defense, published in 1950, which emphasizes powerful punching and utilizing one's whole body weight. He would die on May 31st, 1983, at the age of 87. Jack Dempsey is one of the most famous boxers of all time, with 75 pro fights, with 54 wins, 6 losses, 9 draws, and six newspaper decisions, which was a concept that before a fight would have official judges, the journalists who would be covering the fight would declare a winner through consensus, though on official record it would be listed as a draw. Uh, this is not to be confused, however, with a no contest, which is something else entirely. And of his 54 wins, 44 of them were by knockout. He was inducted into the inaugural Boxing Hall of Fame in 1970 and is still remembered as one of the greatest heavyweight boxers of all time and was an inspiration for generations to come afterwards, including heavyweight champ and ultimately terrifying individual Mike Tyson, who listed him as one of his personal heroes. And like I said earlier, boxing rules had to change due to Dempsey and his legacy, and the neutral corner rule is still a cornerstone of the boxing rule set. Oh, and he also has a fish named after him. This is a Jack Dempsey cichlid, which is a cichlid that is found from Mexico to Honduras and is named after the boxer due to its strong facial features and aggressive behavior. So somewhere along the line, a scientist decided to name a fish after Jack Dempsey and he's got a fish named after him. It's pretty cool, I guess. I mean, I don't have a fish named after me. I bet you don't have a fish named after you either. So yeah, there's that. So that is it for the video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos will be coming out whenever I get around to it and have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. You can have any kind of day you want. See you later.